Thank you, sir, and uh, thanks, Chinnapa, for uh, giving me this, uh, <coughs> this this slot to present our work on abrometry for the rescue. Uh, this is uh, many places I go to. Abrometry or abrometry is used more for just the planning of a refractive surgery, or it's more used like a more of a glorified auto refractometer. There's many many reasons why we should look at it from a different angle. These are my financial interests. The abrometry today, you can actually study from the triers up to the brain in different formats. When you look at an optical system, you have a tears, which is the most important, then the epithelium, the corneal stroma, the lens, and beyond that. These are all the things when aberrations, means just which is not regular, which you can study. So when you look at any aberrations, it all depends on this many factors. Uh, factors of your tear film, how the lens is positioned, you know, that's called the tilt, the ocular tilt, the topography, and that is something which helps you to differentiate the quality versus quantity. This is one of very old slide of mine when we started looking at aberrations. It's one of the reasons people don't want to get into this domain is because the jargon of mathematical words being used. So much of words, people use point spread function, OTF, MTF, and all that. To make it very simple, just with one slide, it's like one language, but different dialect. You know, you use different dialects, you use different writing, you use different formats of it. So it's all about one light, how, you def how each person has defined that particular aberrations or light. I may like to use a point spread function, or somebody may use to use a MTF, but you can actually, if you have somebody has this, you can actually convert using mathematics to this. So it's just a very simple way of looking at it. So if you, if you stick to one form of understanding aberration, that's enough. Let's start with the tear film. Somebody coming with glare. Very common thing which we see in, uh, uh, in your multi multifocal patients having glare post-operatively, where the patient has a very poor tear film, and you can see from this is they have a very uh, poor aberration of the tear film. And this is how it looks, you know, it, it looks like more of a scatter. The, this scatter could be from your epithelium or this could be from your ocular surface. The question which is asked very commonly is, is the cornea the culprit or the lens? I'm not talking about the pseudo -phakic one, I'm talking about the phakic ones out here. So if you use a common modern day abrometers, it tells you the aberrations from your cornea, tells you aberrations from your lens, and what really goes back to your, to your brain. So in this case, the cornea is completely normal, and uh, a little bit of aberrations from the lenses. So in the cornea, you have something called lower order, which is your astigmatism and other factors, and all the higher order aberrations, that's how you divide them. Higher order are your coma, vertical coma, and all that stuff. So this is very important, what I'm going to discuss from a cataract refractive point of view. What happens is we always look at corneal curvature as a steep and a flatter meridian. And for example, if you look at a cornea cylinder, and this is where we have problems. This is why this slide is very important. You have a two diopter cylinder. So when you say two diopter cylinder with the rule against the rule, this is, you're talking only of the lower order aberrations, which is okay for 95% of the people. This is astigmatism and a small amount of coma. You give him glasses, contact lens, you do whatever a patient is very happy because it's just a lower order. But imagine if your person is opposite. He has just a two diopter cylinder, but the major component of cylinder is your higher order aberration, which is your coma. So then what happens? You give him two diopter cylinder, he says it's still not clear. You give him two and a half diopters, he says I'm still not clear. Monday he comes to you with an axis of 110. On a Saturday he says, you give him glasses, he says, you know you're giving me 110 glasses, but it was clear when I was in my room, but when I go back, I don't see it clear. Because you have missed the major component of astigmatism that is the higher order aberration. Exactly the same thing. So you can imagine. Here it's all astigmatism, same five degrees. Here it's all coma. Until unless you know this, you'll keep giving him glasses, he'll keep going to different places, and he'll be terribly unhappy. 
it also implies for all the cataract surgeons also because your axis is based on K1, K2, not on the aberration, not on their abrometry. So that explains the difference of cylinder. That's why and these patients would benefit better with contact lenses, not with glasses. And axis is completely haywire in them. Because the axis there is not based on your K1, K2. Axis there is based on which axis your coma or trefoil is acting. So it's more like a dominance. That means whatever is your dominant aberration, that is the axis will skew towards that. That is how an abrometry helps you. And this is how it works. So your axis of your K1, K2 don't really work. This also is very important when you're treating a patient because you treat a patient based on your acceptance. And in this case, is what you see on the topography and what you accept is normal. So whatever you do, the procedure works very well. What about this patient? You treat him and your corneal topography and what is accepted is totally different. That means that's a totally disconnect from what is there on the cornea to what the patient is actually accepting because it is not dominated by your pure lower order astigmatism because it's dominated by your coma. If you do a regular surgery on this patient, like all of us do, the patient will read 6-6. It has absolutely no problem. The problem with him is he'll always keep complaining. That is, it's not that clear, doctor. I, I feel there's something little fussy. The, I see some letters sometimes. So because you have not corrected him for coma, you just corrected him for the lower order abrasions. So that is one of the major cause of unhappiness. So what do you do in these patients? When you notice that you have higher order of coma or anything in your patient, you then try to customize it. You customize it into a different, there are topo-guided treatments, wavefront-guided, and they treat in a different way. Their ablation pattern is different. Their ablation pattern of normal ablation pattern is there. It's like one bombing there. It's just one one beam of light correcting everything. But look at the same patient. If you use this, it's completely different. So what do you get of this patient is this image. So this is how you, this is when your patient say, I feel that wow effect comes only when you see the E, the last line like this, not the E with the fussy, blurry image. And then he has absolutely no higher order aberration which is bothering him. This is a very, very important concept as refractive surgeons, we should all follow because it really helps to un make people understand that why we should be bothered even if this patient is operated in, uh, in Delhi or some place. He's perfect, but he says he's very unhappy with his quality of vision. Look at this. What he's accepting is just 1.5. But what the cylinder is actually on the topography when you actually on an abrometer is 1.5 diopters. I put 1.5 adapters, he's not able to tolerate it. He says, I can't see better. So it's a big dilemma. If you, the patient is not accepting more, but your machine is saying you'd correct him for 1.5. Now, where is this 1.5 coming from? Where is the difference of one? That is coming from the coma because your glass doesn't correct the coma. So when I put this contact lens for him, for that full correction of 1.5 diopter, he completely becomes perfect. He says, I can see now perfectly. So what does it mean? That means if I correct him now with a customized treatment, then I can get him a perfect vision. That's what I did. I corrected him for 1.5 diopter, which corrects his higher order, which is lower order with just 0.5, which is insignificant, and made him completely perfect. The other thing is now we see a lot of people coming to us at 50, 45. See, I'm not really clear with my vision because now everybody wants perfect vision. And aging does not happen overnight. Aging starts at the age of 35 or 38 for the lens and goes up to 60, 70. So that's something called dysfunctional lens syndrome where you see on a log grading it's perfect, but your abrometry picks up an early change. If the patient is very dissatisfied about your night vision driving, especially myopes, you don't need to wait for it to become yellow. You can treat it any time you want to. Glare is one of the major problems which bothers everybody. 
but our optics has always been understanding the optics on a one dimension. It's a static optics. We could never understand the dynamic. That means we would never understand how the optics changes at different accommodation. So what we brought out for our optics lab is a, it's an abrometer, but it has a capacity to study the accommodation in dynamic mode. In a, that means it's real time. So for example, it gives a stimulus. It's like an ECG. It's an ongoing process. This is your pupil, how it changes with the stimulus. And now you'll see the accommodation happening with this thing. So you actually map the accommodation of each personal, each person. And this is how the accommodation is happening. It's capturing the accommodation. And it gives you the amplitude accommodation and everything. So how does it help? It helps us to study people who don't accommodate well. They're pseudo-accommodating versus people who are perfect. It's just not applying this in, in, in our practice, in our uh, refractive. It's got a huge role in migraine, neuro-ophthalmology, in all the branches where people who come to you have a lot of issues with convergence and accommodation. And this is an interesting case, you know. True pre-ops, 37-year-old males coming to you. You see that accommodation of this gentleman at 37 is perfect. This is great. You, you do a LASIK on him for a minus 2, he will still have some amount of accommodative reserve, so he will not complain much. This is 35-year-old male. This blue line is at 35, his accommodation has gone to flat mode. You do a minus 2 on him. First thing he complains is, I have pain, headache. At the end of the day, my eye strains. I have dark circles I, because he has no accommodation at all at 37. We have, without understanding this, we are touching upon these pre presbyopes and operating them like crazy. So this is where uh, Chinnapa and uh, Dr. Kudlu can look at. These are the patients where you should probably look at your early presbyon because they are the ones who probably would benefit more than your classic patients. And this is again a patient, very interesting thing. The same patient, pre-op was low. I did not know what to do. That time we did the regular LASIK. He started accommodating a little bit. But when, when there's accommodation and he starts feeling that he can't see well, they go into a stage of pseudo-accommodation, which is terribly bad because when they go into pseudo-accommodation like this, they start feeling glare because they go into a spasm because then it's very difficult to get them back because they're using all their accommodative reserve to start seeing. And this is exactly the picture like this, zero, first week, and one month. And they become terribly unhappy. They are the ones who, the other ones, who go and write Google review on you, talk bad about you, they're unhappy with you, they say that LASIK is bad because they can't see near, and now the power, what I corrected was minus two, you can see that he's gone up to minus 5.5. So he's gone up to a five and a half diopters, so you, lot of somebody told him that he's got an ectasia, that's why he's gone up to minus five. It's not ectasia, it's just that he's accommodating so much. So what do we do with them? Most important them is, you have to, most of them, or 99, 100% of them, have convergence insufficiency. That means their convergence goes into an excess mode because they have to give that depth because through convergence, or they have fusional issues. So you need a very good optometrist who can help them out. After uh, three weeks of hospital-based therapy, I call it physiotherapy for the eye because they need some work. They come every day to the hospital, do some exercises, which is given by the Department of Binocular Vision, the same patient went back to 0.25 and the entire thing disappeared. If you don't give them convergence and accommodation exercises, this is never going to go. So the most biggest challenge today is to handle it in multiple zones, and you need an abrometer always to pick up these early clues. And this will tell you, and then it will take you to forward. So in refractive surgery to plan, and cataract surgery for IOL and other things, which probably all of you know, I don't want to go to this. What I just said is probably will help you a lot of unhappy patients in the future. Thank you.